Good evening, this is Mayor Ford. I call this meeting to order at 6 p.m. and state that the notice of the special city council meeting was duly posted. I will now do a roll call of city council. As I call your name, please state here or present. Mayor Pro Tem Preston. Present. Council Member Edwards. Present. Council Member Sterling. Present. Council Member Boney. Present. Council Member Maroulis. Present. Council Member Emery. Present. There will now be a roll call of city staff members and meeting presenters. As I call your name, please state here or present. Interim City Manager Bill Atkinson. Present. Assistant City Manager Glenn Martell. Present. City Attorney E. Joyce Iyamu. Present. City Secretary Maria Jackson. Present. Director of Financial Services, Elena Portis. Present. Budget and Financial Reporting Manager, Bertha Alexander. Present. Accounting Technician, Lee Sue. Present. Director of Communications, Stacey Walker. Present. Chief of Police, Mike Berrison. Present. Radio System Manager, Ben Paul. Present. Recognition and Compliance Program Coordinator, Rachel Murray. Present. Fire Chief, Eugene Campbell. Present. Director of Municipal Court, Brittany Rajic. Brittany. Mayor, uh, uh, Brittany will be on shortly. Okay. Deputy Director of Municipal Court, Norma West. Present. Is there anyone that I did not call who is on the call tonight? Okay, there is no one signed up for public comments. We will start, start with 2A, presentation of the fiscal year 2021 proposed budget. Uh, Mayor and members of council, I, uh, this is Bill Atkinson and uh, want to kind of follow up from last night. Uh, you know, as we discussed, we've got three nights this week that we are uh, presenting information to you with regard to the proposed uh, budget that we'll be uh, starting to, we're in the process of starting to develop that and uh, what we are presenting is not the proposed budget but instead it's an overview of the accomplishments for 2020 uh, the 2021 goals along with proposed enhancements that uh, department heads have the original uh, requests that they have made and uh, they are going through review as well as taking a look at line item by line item uh, year over year expenditures to see exactly uh, what uh, they look like in, in comparison to one another year over year to see if uh, there are needs for increases or decreases in those line items and we're continuing to go through that process and will through the month of July. And then uh, last night there were some inquiries regarding the setting of the tax rate and uh, what was used in the presentation being provided over the uh, three days is, uh, and we mentioned this last night, but I want to kind of reiterate it is that we utilize the new tax cap rate of 3.5% above the effective rate. And tomorrow night in uh, preparation and answer of some questions that came up last night, uh, we will be providing you with some uh, scenarios on what the tax rate could look like uh, based on preliminary property tax rolls and taking a look at them uh, as they as they look like uh, with re respect to the effective tax rate, the uh, current tax rate of 63 cents that we have in place now, and uh, the, what we have been presenting, the 3.5% tax cap rate. And that way you can compare how much is coming in for each and uh, also uh, or see what they would raise. Uh, and again, this will give you an idea of the difference in revenue generation, impact on the amount of revenues, and, and also what does uh, uh, operations or projects that it might support that you might want to see in the uh, the 2021 budget. And then uh, also we did look at the year over year expenditures as I mentioned a little earlier and, and we will continue to evaluate those uh, to make sure that we're not too high and that again we don't shortchange ourselves in the process of uh, looking at those those line by line items and you will see those later in July or early August when we uh, bring forward the final budget. Uh, again, the uh, budget calendar shows, as we talked about the other night, that the, uh, the budget, proposed budget is due to council on or before August 1st, and uh, we will be making that deadline. And uh, so we, uh, we ask that uh, 
you ask any questions tonight that you have and uh, provide your input in order for us to ensure, again, that we're meeting uh, your your goals. We do have your or excuse me, your six priorities, and uh, throughout the process, we want to make sure that we're meeting those uh, and that they're in alignment with what you're requesting. Additionally, uh, we are mindful of utilizing the policies we have in place, such as our fund balance policy, fleet replacement policy, fee study, sales tax, and economic development forecast that are economic forecasting and our economic development plans and uh, your priorities and vision in order to develop the budget. So again, uh, we encourage you, if you uh, have questions, please feel free to stop us and ask. Uh, I've asked uh, uh, the budget team members to uh, make sure we're all taking notes and, uh, and coming back to those questions to make sure that in the future over uh, the next few weeks and uh, the month of July, that we're able to come back to you and advise you as to questions you may have and make sure we hit upon the information that you need when we do present the uh, pr proposed budget for your consideration. So tonight, uh, we do have the public safety focus to, uh, departments. That'll be the fire department first, then court, and then finally police. And so uh, with uh, without any further, uh, anything further, uh, we would turn it over to uh, Chief Campbell, who will be presenting the fire. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, could we forward this slide? Thank you. Uh, the vision for the fire department is 78 professionals who are committed to excellence, honor, and service to all. The mission is to preserve life and property and promote a safe community. Next slide. Um, as you look at our overall accomplishments for the year, uh, we, we uh, filled just about every position on the fire department. We brought on some new firefighters. Uh, we uh, promoted uh, several positions, and I think several of you attended some of these promotional events or either saw them online and I appreciate communications for doing a great job sharing the information as well as uh, started work on uh, station six uh, we've completed 100 percent of the uh, designs and I believe that they're going to the next phase uh, to be finalized uh, and then go out to for the land to be acquired by the city in the month of July when we look at the third accomplishment, I appreciate the support of the citizens and the council. We received two replacement apparatuses. We were able to celebrate that at City Hall earlier this year, as well as uh, we've been working very hard since Hurricane Harvey in 2017 uh, and have recovered almost uh, $800,000. We're just short of that. We're working on some things this week, uh, and we'd be looking. We're looking forward to trying to close out. Uh, our cost recovery from responding to uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, in 2017. Uh, in addition, um, over the years, uh, we uh, have been having the fire marshal's office working uh, with uh, the police department. However, this year we discovered there were some things that we needed to do with our ORI and that we needed to house it here. Uh, we worked with uh, legal and the state to do that uh, and this year uh, we have transitioned and have our own ORI so that was one of several accomplishments not only in that division but numerous accomplishments throughout the department. Our goals for 2021 to continue working on uh, moving forward the building of station six um, and we're hoping to have a groundbreaking sometime this fall for that. Uh, we also look to procure a new engine to support that new station, as well as recruit a diverse pool of people. Uh, and I hope to be working with not only uh, other departments in the city, but other uh, agencies like uh, the community college, uh, the Houston uh, College, uh, and other universities and, and, and schools locally to get some great recruits uh, for our next uh, class. Uh, we continue to follow all state mandates, Texas best practices, national standards, as well as standard of cover. Uh, and we still continue to work through our 2017 through 2022 strategic plan. Um, and we also are working on a 
career planning and succession development guide, which uh, we have developed and are implementing through sending people to schools out of state, to doing things online. We have three or four people who are not only working on their advanced degrees, uh, we have one person uh, going into the doctorate program. We have people looking into their masters and their bachelors, as well as different fire schools. So that is a lot of things that's going on and some of the accomplishments of, of your staff members here. Next slide, please. Our, our numbers haven't changed over the last three years, uh, and our overall budget hasn't really fluctuated much uh, other than the year that we had 15 months uh, in the uh, in that one budget year, uh, it, have, it hasn't changed much. Um, we do have money that has generated revenue from reimbursements from the MUD district in Siena. We thought that was of note, and we do have agreements with Fort Bend County for responding in Fort Bend County. Next slide, please. Uh, over the last year, this has been a team process to develop uh, our budget. Uh, we utilize research. We are data driven. Uh, we use the citizen survey feedback we get from HOA meetings. When we go out and we do uh, community drives or community feedback, we get feedback from people on smoke detectors and other things. This last year, we had some changes on state mandates for housing our air packs, as well as we always looking at our response time goals and trends throughout the United States, and this is how we developed our budget. Um, we've been looking at how we respond to national disasters. That relates to some of the first items you see there for software. We always want to educate the, the public, whether it's on burn prevention or preparing for hurricanes. You see that information there. EOC supplies, we need to be able to supply the EOC should we have an activation. Um, supporting our EMC to make sure they're always trained and up to date those are a couple of the next items. Also training for our uh, EMTs and our paramedics and having the state of our equipment to do that, as well as having the correct cameras to use so we can find hidden fires, the uh, thermal imaging cameras, those are indicated there. Because we're doing such a good job, not only on code working with uh, Otis's group, but also uh, fire prevention, fires are, are really down at a, at a, a 25, 30 year trend that firefighters are, fires are down. So we need to make sure we get people other kind of incident command training that's illustrated there by the blue card training. Also here again, it's been a couple of years since we've done some flood uh, water training, training. And so that's what you see there pictured there. Also Mayday training again. Um, should somebody be lost in a fire, it's very hard to find them and we need to make sure that we have the best train in case somebody is lost inside of a fire, and especially one of our members. Um, talked about protective clothing, next slide. Those are things that we have to replace and we have a 10 year schedule for that. In addition to that also, sometimes gear becomes torn or contaminated, it's not repairable. Next slide, please. Um, talked a little bit about that, the, the uh, gear, um, and you see a lot of it there. Some of it is for incumbents and some of it's for future employees. Um, also, we need to make sure they're protected, not only in, in all weather conditions, but to make sure that they're protected out on the road. Uh, over the last several years, there's been a big push to make sure that we don't lose people while they're out blocking or protecting people from uh, traffic accidents. So that's why you see the vest there. Uh, the self-contained breathing apparatus, also known as air packs. Uh, also making sure that we have the latest data um, uh, uh, equipment for our crews. You can see that as well as communication. Uh, being able to hear and understand somebody who is talking while they have a uh, self-contained breathing apparatus is very important. And so you can see that some of the things towards the lower third of that slide that talk about the communication systems. Um, closing out this uh, slide, uh, cardiac monitors. Uh, Fort Bend County is transitioning all their monitors to a new type of monitor. And so we're gonna phase in over the next several years uh, these type of monitors because we respond with them routinely. 
uh, and it's important that our equipment is similar uh, so we can respond uh, with speed. Um, here again, I talked a little bit about uh, data software, and so we always need to update that and make sure that's current. Uh, it's not been in a uh, reoccurring balance, and so uh, we had to put it uh, on the budget like this this year. In the future, we'll be working with um, IT to make sure we have the right numbers going forward so it can be on a recurring item and not in a supplemental. Uh, and training for that uh, software is down at the bottom. That concludes our supplementals. Any questions for me? Chief, uh, this is Councilman Emery. Yes, sir. Uh, look at supplemental. Is there uh, any uh, any uh, priority sequence that you on these various items uh, so that uh, we uh, address those things that are that are really uh, important from a, from a safety. Uh, and uh, and fire uh, uh, protection. Yes, sir. I um, yes, sir. I um, submitted uh, a submittal letter, and it has them all in priority. Um, I will make sure that we uh, share the information with the city manager. Uh, I know I've sent it into the to the system, and so we'll make sure you have that information. But we do have them prioritized. From the first item down to the last item. Okay. Thank you, sir. Before I close out, I'd just like to say that we have over a million and a half dollars currently under consideration for grants. Um, and as some of these items, if we if we find another resource or we find some savings, some of the items we will try to asked to buy this year versus putting them into next year and that's what we've done over the last several years if we find some savings um, we would try to do some small items for instance some of the software maybe the ballistic vest and some of the other smaller items however the larger items would remain in there and would be prioritized in that memo that i spoke about that concludes my briefing uh this is Councilman Emery again, and maybe the uh, finance is there. Uh, I noticed that uh, one of the items is that we have uh, $736,000 that was reimbursed, I guess, from uh, from Harvey. How are those uh, those dollars used in the budget process? This is uh, Alina Portis, Financial yeah. Services. Uh, when we receive the funds, they basically reimburse the city. So we have uh, a fund that's Fund 800, it's our disaster recovery fund. All of the expenditures for Hurricane Harvey were captured in there, and it's um, pretty much that the general fund was covering that, but we had a receivable from uh, the federal government for from FEMA uh, on the books waiting to be reimbursed. So those funds basically reimburse our cash that was used to pay those expenses, and they're not available for future use. Okay, but are they reflected in the... Uh... Since, since those expenses were, I guess, uh, uh, through the, uh, the general fund or out of the general fund, do these dollars go back into the general fund? Um, th that, is, that is correct. But it doesn't go back into the general fund for use because there was an accounts receivable on the books. We had to accrue the revenue. Uh, I believe we accrued a majority of the balance that was due in fiscal year 19. Um, and so that revenue was accounted for in, in 19. Okay, it's just so an transaction. Yeah. So it's a balance sheet account versus being yeah. a revenue. This is just relieving the receivable. Correct. Okay. And the uh, two and a half million that's, uh, uh, that we had re received revenue, the, we being the, the, I guess, the, the fire operation uh, for, uh, I guess, uh, some of us, for the Siena uh, fire station, um, how is uh, how is that um, used uh, in the budget process? Is so it just that revenue that revenue is uh, recorded as intergovernmental revenue in the general fund, so it offsets our expenses. Okay. okay. 
that answers my question. So questions. basically, the cost of the fire department is being um, funded by that intergovernmental revenue. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Are there any more questions for uh, Chief Campbell? Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to the uh, to court to Ms. Beaufort and uh, Brick, uh, Brittany Ricklick. And uh, is she on the line? I'm not sure if she's on the line, Bill, but I am. Norma okay. West, Deputy Court Administrator. Thank you. Okay, Norma, go okay, ahead. Good, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, just wanted to cover uh, municipal court and our mission. Our mission is to ensure citizens have the opportunity to resolve court cases in a timely manner while receiving fair, impartial, and equal treatment in pursuit of justice. Um, the vision for municipal court is um, uh, to be a court system characterized by excellence, which strives to attain justice for the individual and society through the rule of law. Um, we'll continue to provide the following aspects for municipal court's five-year vision plan, which is to provide equal access to fair and efficient system of justice for all without excess cost. Um, inconvenience or delay and with sensitivity to increasing di a diverse society. Um, offer alternative methods of dispute resolution while receiving, while preserving, preserving, excuse me, the constitutional right to a trial by an impartial judge or jury and research and implement innovative techniques for compliance of court orders. Um, with that, we just want to add that we do provide the same options to everyone, regardless of the case situation. Um, and if you go to, okay, you got the next slide. Okay, so uh, currently we're, um, our software is in code uh, version 9. We are currently in the process of upgrading to version 10, which will streamline a lot of our processes. Um, We've created a collection specialist position to focus on cases that have defaulted uh, with uh, regard to collections. Um, that individual focuses on cases that are uh, past due uh, to try to communicate with citizens and try to get them to um, resolve their cases prior to them uh, going to into a warrant or any type of that situation. Uh, we're partnering with PD to further community outreach efforts um, we've implemented a uh, virtual court during COVID, the COVID closure. So we did work through Zoom and we worked with our judges and uh, prosecutor to get some cases resolved even while uh, the city was um, closed due to the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Uh, we also uh, purchased and implemented um, Yonder, which is a, a cell phone free court for a cell phone free courtroom experience. That is a little pouch that we have purchased that where uh, if we have a citizen, for example, that if not uh, complying with keeping their telephone off during the court session, that we can, the bailiff can uh, put their telephone into this yonder um, cell phone pouch and um, the citizen will hold the, the pouch until court is over. So um, that's a new purchase that we just uh, bought within the last two weeks. Um, also, uh, for the FY 2021 goals, uh, one of our goals is to streamline processes. Um, the next one is to engage in community outreach, um, staff development for succession planning, and evaluate technology for customer accessibility and efficiency. Okay. Um, so currently, our budget is a total of um, as you can see on here, we pretty much doesn't change from year to year, uh, fluctuates very little. We pretty much don't ask for very much. Um, and it pretty much stays pretty much consistent from year to year. Um, so we don't have any supplemental requests as well. Um, so, uh, basically this is our, uh, base budget for now and no supplemental requests. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay. Special Revenue Fund. Okay, so we have our uh, Court Security Building, Court Building Security Fund. Um, that's based on convictions. For example, cases that um, uh, the, the citizens 
determine that they want to pay or, for example, if they go to court and they are found guilty on a case, then um, those funds are, uh, depending on those convictions, that, that certain percentage will go into the building security fund. And that's how this, um, that's how the revenue is, um, how we get revenue for that particular line item. Um, so uh, those are the figures for that there. So that's based on um, case conviction. The core technology, um, it's a revenue generated from fees collected on convictions as well. And, the, and it's used to, to enhance a technology for a municipal court. For example, uh, in code version 10 is one of the things that will be uh, this, for, for example, this particular line item will pay for that, um, that uh, software that we will be um, inputting here recently or currently that we're working on now. So uh, we're, uh, that really helps in, in making us, helping us to enhance our technology and to be more efficient. So that's uh, that fund. And then we'll go on to the next fund. And so next slide, please. And the special revenue fund, we have the court juvenile case um, is generated through fees also collected on convictions. Um, the funds for this particular uh, line item can only be used for juvenile related cases. Um, so for example, um, for juvenile cases um, that we have, we don't have a lot of those, but um, it's not based on that. It's based on any cases that have a conviction and uh, we can only use that for juvenile related programs such as, um, for example, if we have, um, um, like for, for juveniles now, one of the things that we can do is like we'll like go to the schools and talk to the schools about, um, you know, different programs that are available. For example, um, we buy pamphlets, things like that to educate the, the juveniles and also pass them out, have conversations with the juveniles and um, anything that we can come up that we can come up with that we can utilize that uh, line item for, we will utilize that. So um, one of the things that we did purchase uh, was a uh, simulator that we're working with PD on so that people can, the citizens can use that as well as juveniles. Um, another fund that we have is the um, court jury fund. And that's also revenue, rev, revenue generated from fees associated with jury trial cases only. And the funds can be used only for expenses related to jury trials. Um, so uh, that's basically like, for example, when we have jurors come to court, one of the things we do is to uh, provide uh, snacks and things as such for our jurors when they attend court and uh, are a, a juror in, in our court system. And I think that is the last slide. So Mayor and Council, do you have any questions for Norma? Norma, this is Anthony. Uh, I'd like to thank you and the court. Uh, you guys do a lot with just seven FTEs and coming in at a 704K budget uh, is very conservative. Uh, I know you guys are customer facing and, and also a revenue stream, not one that we want, but it's, it's truly a revenue stream. So thank you for your budget. <clears throat> thank you, sir. We, we certainly try. <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, Councilman Emery. Question yes, is, uh, you know, our uh, city is fairly well uh, uh, laid out in uh, different areas of the of the county, and uh, yes, th there's always been a, uh, uh, I think, a desire to try to uh, be able to do as many online uh, payments of uh, fines or uh, anything that uh, in the past you'd have to come down to uh, to uh, municipal court and I know yes, or sir. I think that we have uh, uh, some uh, new capabilities could are we uh, building on that and could you kind of just briefly describe the types of of uh, uh, trans methods yes sir absolutely um, court uh, at, at our court we do have a um, one of the, I'll, I'll go through those processes. We have a drop box where um, people that can't attend court during our court hours, they can, all, they can drop off payments in our drop box. 
we do retrieve those every morning and apply those uh, um, funds to the cases that, uh, that are applicable. And so they can drop off and in the drop box at any time, day or night. And like I said, we do retrieve it in the very next business morning and we apply the money to those cases. Uh, one of the other options that we have is we do have a um, uh, phone system, an IVR phone system that goes through our ENCODE software where individuals can call that number and can pay on, uh, via telephone if they'd like. So they can pay that at any time via telephone. Um, we also have um, a insight, which is a web-based and where they can go online and pay their court cases if they would like as well. Um, they can also come in in person and pay. Um, so that's another option as well. So uh, those are the, the options that we have. We also have uh, located, there's a computer in our lobby. So if any individuals are coming to court and they choose to, or let's say they don't have a computer at home, and they want to come and pay, they can utilize that computer that we have in the lobby for uh, citizens to pay their cases. Okay. And they can also, and also they can mail it in, by the way, as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm sorry, one more thing to add to that. Uh, on our payment plans, like for example, if someone's put on a plan, payment plan on their cases, uh, we do provide all of those um, items on the actual payment plan so that they have and then we do discuss it with them so that they know their different options to, to pay their cases. Okay. Well, the one that I was uh, interested in was the uh, online uh, payment uh, where yes, somebody's sitting down in uh, 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 Creekmont or over in Foundering Park, instead of them having to come into uh, to, to mm -hmm. municipal court, uh, they could pay something, uh, you know, uh, certain types of uh, fines uh, online to to eliminate that uh, that travel. So yes, sir. We have that capability. Are we trying to expand that, or are we as far as we can go? Uh, we are always looking at options to um, you know for individuals to be able to take care of their cases. So um, you know, Brittany and I, in fact, went to uh, the Court Technology Conference last year to try to find any new, um, you know, new and updated um, ways for individuals to take care of their cases or resolve their cases. So we're always looking at that. We're always trying to be innovative. So um, yes, sir, we always look at any options that are available out there. Well, great. Keep up the good work and thank you. For yes, your sir. Service. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, Bill, this is Anthony again. I know a couple budgets ago, I raised the question about uh, the striping in the parking lot when our uh, residents go to the courthouse and or the PD, the striping in that lot uh, is, is very faint, if not not even there. Was that in last year's budget? Did it get done? Um, what are we doing about that? It's... I, I vaguely remember that discussion and I will have to, and I think we did uh, find some money toward the end of the budget year that was unused in uh, public works to do a portion of the parking lots and I believe at the time we did some in parks and we had some funds in parks as well that we utilized to get some park parking lots. And I will have to check with uh, Shashi uh, to see if we have that available this year because I did notice that the other day when I was there as well. So we will definitely check on that. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions, Mayor and Council? All right, well, thank you, Norma. Appreciate your uh, your presentation. Yes, sir, uh, thank next, you. Uh, next, we have uh, Chief uh, Mike Berrison, who will be presenting for the uh, police department along with uh, uh, Ben Paul and uh, Rachel Murray, I believe. And so I'll turn it over to you, Chief. All right, Mayor, Council, thank you for the opportunity to go over our fiscal 2021 budget with you. We'll start with our accomplishments. Um, they told us we had to list only five, but I actually have a page and a half in 12 fonts that I'd love to cover, but in the interest of time, we're going to stick with five. Uh, as you all are keenly aware, the city continues to be ranked among the safest cities in Texas by several top-rated rating associations, organizations. Uh, we are a training provider, one of only two in the county that's TCOL or uh, allowed by the commission to provide law enforcement training not only for our own officers, but officers across the, uh, the nation predominantly, though we stick to Texas officers. We hosted 
57 training classes for a total of 239 training hours. So that's about 460 officers set those classes for a collective total of over 2,500 Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Education training hours. And we sent four mid-level and command level staff members to executive level training to uh, work toward our secession planning and improve our intellectual capital. Uh, moving on to code enforcement, we conducted 26 neighborhood sweeps for a total of uh, 14,750 investigative actions. Uh, honored to say that our recruitment is better than it's been in decades. Every one of our sworn police officer positions are filled. We have no vacancies in that area. The only vacancies that we have in the entire department of 104 police officers and 44 civilian personnel will be four emergency telecommunicator positions that are unfilled. And we're diligently working trying to fill those. We again were able to reduce our part one crime frequency. As you all know, part one crimes are the uh, violent crimes or crimes against person type of crimes. Uh, we were able to reduce those crime frequencies Again, uh, to a, we had a 12% reduction from 2019 to 2018. And as you all recall, our 2018 numbers were lower they, than they had been in quite some time over the past six years. Our 2019 numbers are even lower than those. So we continue to see a downward trend uh, during 2019 of our crime trends. We also were able to reduce our vehicle crashes to the tune of seven percent in our DDAX area. And as you all know, our DDAX is our uh, focused traffic enforcement area to try to reduce crime and traffic safety or improve traffic safety. So we've been successful in that arena. Moving on to goals, uh, our leadership development, like I say, our succession planning, we talked about our uh, mid-level managers and upper command level personnel that we have sent to training, we continue to do that. We have several in the queue to go to uh, Quantico at FBI National Academy, and also several to go to the Leadership Command College at Sam Houston State University to develop our patrol and mid-level managers to move up to command level. So when all the old timers leave, we'll have a, uh, a steady stock of in-house folks that should be able to carry the torch forward and take us to even higher levels than we currently are. Community interaction, we, as our uh, mission statement says, we, uh, we understand that cooperation and collaboration with our community is what it takes to make our city a great place to live. And to that end, we attended and interacted with our stakeholders at more than 366 HOA and or civic meetings during the year. Uh, or we're planning, we plan to do that again this year. We did it last year. I don't know what the number was, but we've added 366 to our upcoming goals. Our up upcoming goals for uh, to reduce part one crime frequency, we, we plan to strive for an additional 2% reduction in 2020, which will take us even lower than we've been in uh, more than eight years. We were successful in doing that. And then we continue to strive on reducing our vehicle crashes, hopefully to get a 5% reduction in that uh, focused area, that DDAX area. Next slide, please. Uh, as stated earlier, we have an authorized uh, FTE component. Uh, and I said earlier, 104 and 44 sworn, I mean, non sworn. Uh, the reason that number is not accurate there is because our radio systems manager is partly paid for by uh, the city of Sugarland. We'll talk about that here in a moment when we get to the radio systems budget. And then one of our code enforcement officers, he is paid by the CDBG funding. Uh, our overall budget this year is 14,233,579, which compared to last year is about a uh, roughly 85 to 90 thousand dollar reduction in our budget from last year and we had the same reduction the year before so we continue to try to run as streamlined as possible uh, as you'll notice our supplemental request we've asked for nothing extra we're going to run as streamlined as, as we can and because i realize that things are, are 
certainly tough everywhere, and, and the police department is trying to run as streamlined as we possibly can to make sure the other departments uh, get up to where they need to be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, special revenue fund. Uh, I spoke earlier about we're not making any um, requests this year. We didn't make any last year. Uh, and I know that uh, our mayor pokes at me sometimes to say this, that I don't spend any money out of that seizure fund. Well, I am happy to report during this current <laughs> budget year, we're going to spend about $306,406 on things that we didn't ask for in the budget. We're letting the uh, seized drug money pay for those things. So we'll continue to do that again uh, next year or in fiscal year 2021. But as you all see, the asset seizure forfeiture fund covers a lot of things. We budgeted $233,657 uh, we had a proposed expenditure of 320, which will leave us a net of uh, 172,686. Now that's not the total amount that we have in the seizure or the special revenue fund. That's what we expect to spend. Uh, we actually have a, a uh, an approximate balance in that special revenue fund of about 540,000. As you see right there in front of you, that's what we, we plan to spend. So we try to take it down to zero. And then the public safety grants, uh, the one that's reflected during the ex this next coming fiscal year 2021 is the JAG grant. And that is a no match grant. And we're utilizing it for the officer safety and wellness program to reduce our insurance costs for purchasing uh, weight equipment for the officers to utilize. And also we've changed our, uh, our physical agility test to a, a rowing machine examination, a lot like the Texas Department of Public Safety utilizes. In fact, we're basically using their program to evaluate potential police officer candidates. Uh, that being said, we still have other grants that aren't listed on here that we manage, but because they're not during fiscal year 2021, uh, for example, the Crime Victims Advocate Grant that's covered through HGHC to the tune of about $46,500. Uh, that's a two-year grant that pays for the salary of our crime victims liaison. And then also our uh, tech stock grant, the STEP grant, uh, is a recurring grant that is about $28,000 that covers overtime for strategic traffic enforcement. So uh, at any given time, we're managing about $86,500 in grants. Like I said, the only one that's reflected on this slide happens to be the, uh, the JAG grant is the one that we're dealing with in uh, fiscal year 2021. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is the radio communication systems fund. And this is the one that I said is the uh, co-owned fund, if you will, between the city of Sugarland and the city of Missouri City. Uh, Sugarland reimburses the city of Missouri City for one half of the cost and maintenance of the radio systems tower that's located here on this Missouri City Public Safety Headquarters complex. Uh, the city agreed to operate 800 megahertz trunk radio system uh, about 30 years ago, actually a little more than 30 years ago. So those things have to be upgraded uh, often. And that budget is an exact mirror image of uh, last year's budget. Uh, we didn't see any uh, out of the world expenditures and we were able to manage it and keep it completely flat. Uh, the only things that uh, we expect to spend and we have monies still in this current budget uh, to support the radio system is a, a switch uh, that we're gonna put in, that we're gonna include in what we've already requested that allows the, officer, or the telecommunicators to switch between our 911 system and the EMS or adjacent fire and police department 911 systems without having to manipulate three mouse to uh, pull that off and be clicking nonstop. It's uh, basically a one, one operation switch. Uh, I think that's the last slide we have. Uh, make sure, next slide, yep, questions. I know it went kind of fast. Is there any questions, council, mayor? I, I don't have a question. This is Mayor Ford, but I do want to say thank you 
for making sure that we, when we do use that fund, that we're using it properly. Because I know a lot of people try to get their hands on that money. You talking about the? Are you talking the, about the, uh, the seizure? seizure? Money? Yes. Yeah. Do you know yes. what? Somebody's already told you what's on it, then, huh, Mayor? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, and I do tease you all the oh. time, but I know people are always trying to spend that money for you. Oh, <laughs> well, they do. They do. <laughs> we're, hey, we're, Chief. We always try to spend this. Hey, Chief, this is Anthony. Uh, I have a question regarding our commercial vehicle inspection program. Um, do we plan on ramping that up or keeping it uh, just kind of as is until we get over some of the pandemic? Well, we actually started operating again. Uh, we, are you talking about actual uh, issuing citations or actually inspections? Uh, inspections in general, and then, um, you know, is there enough out there to maybe look at expanding it to possibly one or two officers ra um, rather than one? Yeah, we currently have two. We have uh, okay. uh, two that work around the clock. I don't see us expanding it anytime soon because our primary focus is to make sure that we have resource to respond to, you know, in progress calls. But okay. if we were to expand it in years to come, they'd certainly have plenty to do with all the, the you know, heavy truck traffic and all those uh, commercial vehicles that do traverse through our city. But we haven't, uh, we haven't laid off. We've, we've kept our enforcement up. We didn't write as many citations during COVID for obvious reasons, one of which our, our court was running, or actually not running there for a while. Now they're running kind of streamlined or, or limping along until they get up to snuff. And plus, People are under enough stress right now with a pandemic that we weren't going to add uh, fines and all that on top of anybody if we could help it until some of this cools out. Yeah, no, I, I see Officer Vote out there a lot doing good work, and I know he's, you know, very conservative. I just, uh, I didn't know that we wanted to maybe build on that program, but uh, okay, that's good information to know. Yeah. Uh, the well, last we question. Grant, we do have a grant through TxDOT for that. We just have to pursue it, but we We've got to be careful on those matches when we do that because you yeah so the events come with pretty pretty tough matches so we have to be mindful of that but uh but boat and avon both actually work commercial motor vehicle enforcement okay thank you chief yes sir chief this is council member preston <clears throat> thank you for your presentation for your presentation i'm aware that several of our officers are trained in health and crisis intervention I'm yes, also sir. aware that you're using drug seizure money this budget cycle to purchase an unmarked car for mental health transport. But in the future, are you looking at the possibility of hiring a mental health officer? You know, that's actually a good question. Uh, you, know, you may hear sometimes, Mayor Pro Tem, you'll hear that other organizations say they have a mental health officer. You, you know, when you hear them say that, just be sure to dig a little deeper. Um, in Missouri City at one time, we had 86% of all of our sworn personnel certified to be crisis intervention officers. So they've had the maximum amount of crisis intervention training that the Texas Commission for Law Enforcement Officers Education allows. And I don't know what that percentage is now. I think with our new hires and with the pandemic, we don't, we're not quite at 86, but it's still significantly higher than most. Um, so let me give you a short answer to your question and I'll, I'll give you some backfill. The short answer is I don't plan to hire just one um, mental health officer. I plan to have just about every one of my patrol officers trained to that maximum level. So technically they all could wear that title, but what I'm using that money for, and I knew you would stay on top of this stuff, I am actually using drug seizure money to buy an unmarked car because by statute, when a person is in mental crises, is diagnosed at an evaluation center and then uh, advised to be transported to a treatment facility. It has to be done in an unmarked car and by personnel that are not in the standard patrol type uniform. They have to either be in the soft uniform that most of us inside wear or plain clothes. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna have a, like an on-call basis with personnel that wanna respond in with that unmarked car to transport transport those folks that are being, uh, they've already been evaluated and now they need to be transported to a treatment facility. 
And you're right, I'm using the uh, seizure money to pay for that unmarked car. Uh, the other thing is, I'm all, we're one of the only agencies that have trainers also that can train and teach people to be crisis intervention officers. I actually have three on staff. That's probably uh, one to two more than most agencies in the entire region have, other than the real large agencies. And uh, I'm about to have uh, probably two more in short order to uh, train additional personnel. The uh, pandemic has kind of put a damper on our training because we're not allowed to have too many people together at one time. Thank you. Chief, yes, this is Mayor Ford. Um, I think maybe two budget sessions ago, um, I briefly mentioned that um, there was a police department up north and kind of some of them have started uh, putting like at least one dispatch person that's taking calls that can handle mental health calls. Have we looked into that? Well, um, for short in dispatch is, is once yeah, the money starts to go up, I'd love to have what's called a tactical dispatcher that'll handle uh -huh. issues just such as that. Uh -huh. uh, a tactical dispatcher can also handle, you know, like when a fire breaks out, they'll focus entirely on the fire scene so that they're not doing 10 other things while they're managing a fire scene or a police pursuit or, or you know, or civil insurrection. Those, those tactical dispatchers can have that. But uh, if I, if funding ever allows, I'd love to have what, exactly what you're talking about. So we, we do have four. I've got uh, Ben Paul is in here with me, who's over at dispatch, tell me we already have four that are trained. Oh, I'm sorry, going to speak up is on the list. Uh, we have four that are going to training to be just what you just said. They're going to be trained for crisis intervention. Okay. Uh, and, and Rachel Murray uh, probably is a subject matter expert on this because she has a, a degree in this area. So I'm going to pass that you know, better answer there. Go ahead, Rachel. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to also point out that per our TPCA recognition, our state recognition system, all of our employees are required to have some type of mental health training. It is a requirement. So all of our dispatchers, all of our officers have the baseline amount of training when it comes to mental health. As Chief previously said, we do have three people that are currently instructors in specialized mental health training. And we plan on moving forward with getting a lot more officers that specialized training. It's just come to a halt because of COVID. But with the vehicle purchase, we will be able to move forward with the specialized training and hopefully have a whole team of people to be on call for that specific purpose. Okay. Mayor and Council, you have any other questions for uh, Chief Bears and the team? Yes, uh, this is Councilman Emery. Uh, question back on uh, Chief, uh, your succession planning, uh, and uh, you have a number of folks who are, I guess, in the pipeline to go to some of the uh, uh, educational uh programs uh and uh i guess my question is uh are, are they in the pipeline uh waiting for uh either uh, uh the uh, appropriate funding to become available or is it a matter of uh scheduling uh your your personnel uh no sir uh the uh FBI Academy, they invite you. You put yourself on a, on a queue to go and if you're interested, they look at your credentials, do a background investigation, and then they invite you. So you're at their mercy. Uh, we generally have someone in either a lieutenant or higher at the FBI Academy about every uh, six sessions they have. And they, they were running six sessions per year. Uh, they've already canceled the one that's supposed to be going on now, and they'll cancel the next one. So that kind of threw a wrench in the works there that they're not going to have as many sessions per year. Uh, like I said, we used to, every six session, we would have somebody in, in the FBI Academy at Quantico. And then the uh, Leadership Command College, uh, that also, you have to go through a, an evaluation or orientation period to make sure you uh, have the aptitude to successfully pass the course. And that's three phases. And I've already got several personnel, as I spoke earlier, that are either in the uh, second or 
third phase and ready to complete the first phase. And again, they're waiting for him, the people that are in the queue are waiting for invitations from that organization to go. But they also canceled all their classes because of COVID. So COVID has really put a wrench in our work. So uh, hopefully we get past this obstacle so we can meet our goals next year. So this time next year, I'm not having to uh, blame COVID for our failure to get our people into uh, executive level training. And to, to expand on that, we don't expect a patrol officer to come straight from patrol to know how to manage a $14 million budget and know how to be a quality supervisor and how to lead people. That's what those executive level trainings do. It's an advanced course in leadership and budgeting. Okay. So I can assume from, from that that uh, funding is not uh, the issue of getting people through uh, those training sessions. No, sir. In fact, the FBI Academy, the room and board and, and the study materials, uh, on April 15th of every year, you pay for it. The federal government covers the cost. The only thing that the city covers is the salary while the officer is at the training and the travel to and from the FBI Academy for one visit home and their uniforms that they wear while they're in the academy. And for the Leadership Command College, that is also covered by the persons in the state of Texas, $1 out of every fine paid in municipal courts and uh, JP courts and county courts across the land goes into a special revenue fund that the Texas legislature, and they use that to pay for people to attend the Leadership Command College. So again, the only and we pay for them, them is their per diem for food and their salary while they're away and the gasoline that takes them to drive to Huntsville, Denton, or Texas A&M and back. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Someone have a question? I guess we, uh, have we finished? So uh, thank you, uh, Chief Campbell, uh, Norma West, and uh, Chief Bearson. Uh, appreciate the uh, presentation and that concludes and let me before we do conclude this section of it again for, in general for public safety or for any other questions you might have from uh, last night or something else related to the budget uh, we'd be happy to entertain those now uh, otherwise we, we will be finished with this section of the agenda so are there any questions we can answer for you Okay, he hearing none, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Mayor. Um, the next um, session, I've asked that the police give us um, an overview on the policing policies. Um, of course, during this time, I've gotten lots of emails in reference to our policies uh, and concerns. So I wanted uh, the chief to give us an overview of our policing policies, as well as for us an opportunity to ask any questions that we may have in reference to any of our uh, use of force. So go ahead, Chief. All right. I know initially you requested an overview of our policing policies. If I went over mm -hmm. the entire policy manual, we're talking about 40 hours of training. No. <laughs> no, just... Some basics, more so. I've sent you quite a, you know, a couple of emails. I've gotten quite a few emails just in reference to the use of force. All right, Mayor. What I'll probably use is the uh, guideline that several of the citizens have sent you and uh, Councilmember Edwards. Uh, and okay. It came, from, came from Campaign Zero, called Eight Can't Wait, and it's referring to eight policies that Campaign Zero stated that would cause a 72% reduction of people being killed at the hands of police, basically. So what I'll do is I'll go through each one of those eight uh, suggested policies and tell you what's covered and what's not in Missouri City's policy, uh, policies. And 
uh, one thing I do need to correct because the very first question was, and that eight can't wait, and it has to do with there's a ban on chokeholds or strangleholds. And I initially answered several citizens, and I co copied uh, you all whenever it would come through, so you'd see what I answered with the citizens. But I said, uh, it says, does Missouri City have a ban on chokeholds or strangleholds? And initially I said, no, there's not a ban on chokeholds or strangleholds. And the reason I said that is because we don't mention it at all in our policy. We do now, and I'll explain that. But we didn't at the time when I answered that a week ago. And But if I'd known what the, the federal definition of a ban was, I could have answered that, yes, we do have a ban. Because the federal definition of a ban says that you cannot use a chokehold or a stranglehold unless deadly force is authorized. Well, that's technically been our practice for more than 30 years. Uh, it's just we never specifically spelled it out. But with the executive order that came out of the president's uh, office on June 16th, our credentialing body, which I'm going to keep uh, Rachel Murray in the office with me or in the room with me, uh, as we speak through this, because she's my program manager for our credentialing body, which is the Texas Police Chiefs Association. We received a directive from our credentialing body saying that we have to include that verbiage in our policy manual, which we now do have it in our policy manual, and it's in our code of conduct uh, where it states that, uh, I'm sorry, it's in our use of force policy. 20-07, where now we've added that chokeholds or carotid artery neck restraints are prohibited unless the officer involved is justified in the use of deadly force. So Any Chief, can, I'm sorry, right. can we, before you get too far, far into that, can we make yeah. sure we get that information out, have Stacy push that out uh, as a, a media release? So Absolutely. as- yeah, everything, everything I'm telling you now, we can push out the media release. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. But, uh, no, it's okay. It goes on to say, any officer using such force will cease immediately upon control of the subject. And that's normally when the person has either been handcuffed or is no longer actively resisting. And again, the application of appropriate medical response if needed. Uh, it says officers are required to report these incidents through the process outline and our agency's use of force support process. So we ever have a reporting process in our policy as part of our credentialing anyway, and we had it prior to being a, a recognized credentialed agency, but any use of force, whether it's uh, pointing a firearm at someone or uh, you know physically grabbing them, we report all of our force. And, and that's also on our open data initiative that, that I talk about every year that those numbers, are, that raw data is open for anybody to review on our city's webpage. And it has been since I uh, went and worked on the 21st Century Policing Report. I was part of the rollout for that, and I started that. In fact, I was one of the only, we, Missouri City, were one of the only agencies in the entire region that put that raw data out there, and we still do it. So, uh, so back to that first question, does Missouri City ban chokeholds or strangleholds? Like I said, initially I said no, but yes, we absolutely do. And I just said where it is in our policy. Uh, the number two question, y'all can stop me at any time if I'm going too fast or I need to clarify something. Uh, you all know me well enough to know I'm not sensitive, so just jump in. Uh, the number two question on the questionnaires that uh, you all were probably receiving, it says, does Missouri City require de-escalation? And that's actually in our policy also in uh, 2007 which is our uh, use of force policy. And it says, yes, when possible officers are expected to de-escalate. And we, uh, we teach that anyway. Uh, we do our mandatory taser and uh, other weapons training every year. And we, that's just called being a good person. Uh, no, no logical person, no reasonable person wants to harm another person. That being said, that's kind of sometimes what our public expects us to do to protect the lives and property of others. So to say we've never used force, that'd be a foolish statement, but we do all we can to encourage someone to 
comply without us ever having to even touch them. If we can talk them into the back of the police car and have them put their own handcuffs on, we'd have them do that. But sometimes that's just not practical. So, yes, yeah, so we always try to de-escalate, and they're certainly expected to do so. Uh, so, Chief, this is, Mayor, this is Mayor Ford again. I just want to point out an example of that. Um, on Ken Forrest the other night, you guys had an incident where um, your officers, I guess a guy was on drugs um, and they had to basically, I guess, work with him to just get him into uh, an ambulance to get him off the scene. So that is something that uh, they actually, um, someone filmed it and put it on social media. I don't know if you had heard about that yet. I have, but that, I wasn't surprised because I see body camera video of those incidents uh, frequently. You know, we generally respond to three to five mental health calls a day. Uh, uh -huh. you know, it's not uncommon. So those types of calls are quite common, not only in Missouri City, but, but pretty much nationwide. And how that went down, I'd love to blow our own horn and pat ourselves on the back and say hey, Missouri City acting like superstars, but that's actually how the majority of police departments nationwide respond to those types of calls. Yeah. It's a they, rare they, did a, they did a very good job. I mean, very yeah. good job. They were very uh, patient. Sure. Uh, it was several officers on the scene, and they just basically, you know, as he went through his whole kind of violent rant, and even at some point, you know, kind of was aggressive with the officers, but they did a very good job with him. Yeah, I think we eventually had to force him to the ground and then uh, handcuff him and then put him up on, uh, on a stretcher so the paramedics can give him some uh, medication to relax him a little bit. But yeah, uh, I saw it. I, I certainly appreciate your, your complimentary words and, and I'll make sure that I pass it on to the, that whole crew that was out there. But I'm, I'm proud of the men and women that you all have allowed to be your police officers. Uh, and, and it's an honor to serve them and you. So, uh, yeah, it's what I see every day. Our guys do an amazing, guys and gals, do an amazing job each and every day. So I'll, I'll certainly pass that on. Okay, thanks. Uh, the number three question that you all were posed, it says, does Missouri City require a warning before shooting? And no, there's no, and it says requirement. It says there is no requirement to provide a warning before discharging their firearms. As much as I think that would be a lovely thing to have, that's not always possible. Sometimes these uh, police shootings happen in an instant. You walk up to a car and next thing you know, someone's firing a gun in your face. You really don't have time to tell them, hold it, I'm about to shoot you when you're dodging bullets. So, I'd, you know, whoever suggested that policy probably has never walked a mile in a police officer's shoes. Uh, years ago, I don't know if you all remember, we had an activist that's quite prominent in the Houston area was going to come here and show us how to properly apply force. And after the third scenario that we put him through, he started shooting everybody. And we had to calm him down and say, you can't shoot everybody. you got to try to de-escalate. And all he said all the way out the door after it was over was, if they would just comply, most people would be okay. So the old adage of you've got to comply in order to have an opportunity to complain later is so important. So there is no requirement to provide a warning before discharging our firearm. Uh, it's back to that de-escalation. If we have an opportunity to get some way to drop their weapon or, or stop their aggression before using any force, we're going to do it. But, you know, having an absolute requirement before you discharge a firearm, that's just not even feasible. Uh, any questions on that one? Because that, that's about the only no I'm going to give you tonight uh, as far as these eight can't wait. Uh, Hearing your question, we'll move on to uh, number four. It says, does Missouri City exhaust all the other means before shooting? And that's an absolute yes. We do all we can not to use any force on anybody, much less deadly force. So it goes right back to the de-escalation that we train every day, making sure that you hire the proper people, that they recognize that they are to be part of the community, not uh, run you know, control over the community. That's not how it works here. Uh, we've had officers that have lost their way and we told them this isn't for you. Uh, they may not have necessarily violated policy, but their philosophy of policing was going astray and they weren't willing to change their ways. 
We basically told them this isn't the place that you want to continue policing. We strongly recommend you go someplace else. And most of them have chosen to do that. Uh, there's only been a rare occasion we had to do it for them. So that goes back to whom you all entrust to be su in supervision here at your police department. So we always do all we can to exhaust all means before any use of force, especially deadly force. Number five, it says, does Missouri City have a duty to intervene? And it was throughout our policy to where officers are required to uphold the law, regardless who's breaking the law, but because of the presidential executive order and our credentialing body, we actually have to spell that out now, which is actually a good thing. So it's now listed in our code of conduct 10.01, where it says any employee present and observing another employer, regardless of rank, using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances shall, when in a position to do so safely, intervene by verbal and or physical means to prevent the use of excessive force. Examples of force that would require an employee's intervention may include, but are not limited to, the use of chokeholds. In any situation where deadly force would not be authorized, using force against a restrained or a subdued individual, leaving a secured suspect in a prone position in any fashion that restricts breathing or blood flow. Any use of force in violation of this department's policy. Also, employees shall promptly report those observations to a supervisor. The obligation to report remains in place even if the employee is successful in intervening in the excessive use of force. Any failure to intervene or failure to report the improper use of force is grounds for discipline. So not only does a person that misapplied force or used excessive force gets in trouble, he or she who failed to do something about it and fail and or failed to report it, they also get in trouble. We've spelled that out clearly in our code of conduct and then we repeat it again, uh, the exact same verbiage in our use of force policy. So now it's twice that these officers, are, it's spelled out in our policy and that's per our credentialing body and that's how it's going to be. And I've seen that actually take place in our city to where someone is applying too much force because they just got too excited. And I've seen our officers grab them and say, stop and knock it off and stop it. And they've always reported it. <coughs> Excuse me. So yes, we do have a duty to intervene. Uh, the next question is, does, does Missouri City ban, shoot, ban shooting at moving vehicles? No, there's not a ban at shooting moving vehicles, but they're all trained that five ounces of lead is not successful in stopping a ton of steel coming at you. And you are all, they're all trained not to stand in front of a moving car. Uh, so although there's no ban on it, our training clearly teaches against it. Uh, so no official ban, uh, because I'd love to say that there's absolutely no case where that would be the appropriate thing to do, but you know, every, every situation is different. Uh, I will tell you the last time an officer shot at a car to disable it, he received discipline for it. So, you uh, know, Rachel actually is my policy superstar, but she's waving at me. So I'm gonna let her jump in because I may have misspoke here because it talks about in policy 27 section uh, 5B5, and that's probably what she's probably showing me. That's exactly what I'm showing you. Shots yeah. at or from moving vehicles will not be discharged unless all other means of defense have failed. An officer shall not voluntarily or recklessly place him or herself in a position in front of an oncoming vehicle where the need for deadly force is a likely outcome. Yep, so she, she put it in a much uh, more eloquent manner than I mumbled a while ago. So, uh, yeah, in the most recent one we had, the officer actually received discipline for that. Uh, his, his heart was right, but the practice was wrong. So, uh, and he, he clearly understands the error of his way. And that was several months ago, I guess. If that happened, I can't remember uh, how many months ago it was. But uh, so technically no ban on it, but they're not supposed to do it except extreme circumstances. And the number seven question on the eight can't wait says, does Missouri City require use of force continuum? And yes, we have an established use of force continuum that starts with basically mere presence and of course elevates all the way up to deadly force. That doesn't mean that you step on every rung of that ladder of the force continuum because sometimes as soon as you show up, 
you may be engaged by gunfire and you can't you know go through all the steps but yeah uh, you can't just use any kind of force for any type of force being shown against you because just because somebody's arguing with you you can't just go up there and start whacking them across the head that's not going to happen and we we it goes back to supervision and making sure you hire the proper people that understand we're here part of the community we're not here to reign over the community so that's and our body camera has been our best friend because we get accused of a lot of horrible things and we watch the body camera and half the time it's people's perception on how things went down and we'll invite them in to come watch the camera or the footage later and they realize how bad their perceptions were and realize they they oftentimes apologize to us for complaining on an officer when the events really didn't go down as they as they did and there's several occasions where some of you all on council where I've invited you all to come see the, the video and some of you have and realized it was report what was reported to you either through the grapevine or directly was completely inaccurate of what was recorded on the body cam video so thank you this council and the council's prior for providing the funding for us to have that technology both in the cars and on the officers and even our code enforcement officers wear body cameras now which has been helpful uh, we noticed a while ago that the st louis police department is just now starting to ask for body cameras so i can't believe they're not with the program but um, it's really really helped us so um, that really helps people stay within that force continuum also because like i said i try to hire and, and retain the best that our community has to offer but i hire humans so i realize that sometimes we got to monitor their behavior make sure that they're not uh, acting out on pressures beyond work or even at work so that's again back to your supervision who do you entrust to run your police department and finally mayor and council the last question is does missouri city require comprehensive reporting and what i had to look up on the uh, campaign zero website to understand exactly what they were asking there but they're asking are you required to, to uh, document your use of force and yes we do and that's in our policy uh, use of force policy 20-07 uh, section 7 so that is actually in the policy that yes every use of force we document in fact the use of force that the mayor or the mayor that you mentioned earlier on Ken Forrest every one of the officers that has to lay hands on that young man and push him to the ground and hold him down to the stretcher filled out a use of force report because they used what we call basically hard hands or takedowns. So every one of those officers had to complete a use of force report. So that, that's pretty much our use of force without going in depth in a whole bunch of other areas. But I, I've also printed out uh, for discussion purposes, because I know some of the questions out there were had to do with tear gas. Do, uh, do we use tear gas? Well, we don't really have the uh, resources to handle civil disturbances or for, a, for a insurrection, we have to make a phone call to either the Houston Police Department or the Texas Department of Public Safety if something like that were to occur in Missouri City. Uh, we, we simply just don't have the resources for uh, you know the helmets and the shields and the armored cars and and the tear gas. We just and rubber bullets. We don't have that. Uh, so uh, hopefully, bad people aren't listening to this right now and decide to come play in Missouri City. But uh, we'd have to make a quick phone call to, like I said, Houston and Harris County, and I guess the National Guard. I know they're in standby in a lot of cities, and I know they're in standby here in, in the Houston area. So that's who we'd have to call in those circumstances. <coughs> so hopefully I didn't talk too much, and if you have any additional things that you think I can clarify based on the questions you've received from uh, concerned community members, please let me know. And, and before I Quit talking in this little section here. If you ever have a, a situation where someone's asking you something from the community, I do not mind being looped in. I don't mind working with you to answer as many questions or even have the folks come by and visit. I mean, during COVID, it's kind of a challenge for us, but this is my police department. This is the community's police department. They're welcome here just about any time during the normal business hours anyway. All righty. Thank you, Chief. Are there any questions for the Chief? All righty. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's the end of our agenda. If there's no further business, we are adjourned. <laughs>